Um, let me introduce the people who are here with me today. First of all, I'm Jane Elizabeth. Um, I am the research director for the American Press Institute. And with me today, um, we're very happy to have Angie Holan, who is the editor of PolitiFact, based in Washington, D.C. She's right there. Um, we have um, Sarah Stombly, who is right over here. Um, Sarah is a PhD in um, political, political news. Okay, yes, <laughs> at, um, at NYU, and she's also a postdoc at Rutgers, um, working on the News Measures um, research project. And we're very happy to have Angie McGuire, who is the editor of the New Jersey Data Book, and I'm told that everybody in this room should know what that is. Um, and she is a, a professor of public management also at Rutgers. So, and she is right here. So. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about API and why we're doing this project. I promise that eventually in this session we will get to the fact checking part, but we um, are really serious about giving you some building blocks and some research and some background on why we're doing this and why it's important first, and then we'll get to the hands-on stuff. Um, the American Press Institute is a very old institution. Some of you are familiar with it, some of you are not, but it was actually created in the 1940s and it's undergone a lot of changes as the news industry has changed. Um, right now we're a very small organization, nonprofit, nonpartisan, we've always been that way. Um, and we're focusing on doing workshops like this, but also really on the think tank and research part of this. So. Everything we do has research behind it, and um, Sarah has been helping us with that, and we also have a team of researchers who are working on fact-checking, just on fact-checking, believe it or not. Um, they are doing some really interesting projects right now, and their, um, their studies should be ready by sometime in the spring, and we'll be happy, of course, to share that with you. Um, so let me tell you about the background of the fact-checking project, which might just seem kind of out of nowhere to some people. Um, but we did get a very generous grant to study fact-checking. It was um, uh, late last year. And the idea behind it is that we want to, first of all, study fact-checking and its impact and how to do it the best way possible, and then go out and teach reporters and students and editors um, the best way to do fact checking running up to the 2016 elections, very important elections. Of course, a lot of you are already doing it for the 2014 elections, and that's great, but we're hoping that by 2016 that we will have many, many more people doing fact checking and doing it um, in the best way possible. So that's the that's a background on our fact checking project, which is a two-year project. Um, so I am going to put this Angie on the spot and ask her what fact checking is. So we were talking about this last night and Angie is unusual because she's like a full-time fact checker and not many people can say that they're full-time fact checkers. So if you're at a cocktail party or just any kind of party or um, a place where there aren't journalists there and you say you're a fact checker, how do you explain that to people exactly? Well, I usually start on a kind of uh, a big picture level, and I say we okay, we look at the uh, we look at the rhetoric, and we compare it with the reality, and we write up our report based on what is the difference there between the rhetoric and the reality. Um, we are doing old-fashioned news reporting, but the framework for it is fact-checking. That keeps the focus on accountability. Um, it keeps the focus on the evidence, logic. Uh, our stories are um, uh, fueled by traditional reporting, but the writing is a little different. Because in our writing, we make it really clear what, what we're doing. We say the politician said this. Uh, we wondered if it was true. Here's the evidence. Here's our conclusion. And that's where fact checking can be a little bit different from traditional journalism particularly political journalism, because with political journalism, you're often explaining trends or reporting on what just happened. Um, with fact-checking, the focus is on, is this statement, this campaign ad, this comment, this thing set a debate, is this accurate? Does this reflect reality? So that's my definition of fact-checking. Okay. So it is kind of hard to explain fact-checking. Um, 
I think that most people, I almost wish I had another term. I wish this whole thing, this whole project was called something else because it almost sounds like you work for a magazine that does fact checking or you're a copy editor. And a lot of the questions I get is, well, I'm a reporter and I check my facts, so I'm a fact checker. Um, and what we're trying to do with this project is to define fact checking um, in a little bit more elite terms so that um, there is some science and research behind it. In other words, not everybody can be a fact checker. Um, so I should have said before that everybody in this room, if you want the slides, you will get the slides um, after this is over with. There are a lot of links in here and a lot of resources that we just do not have time to go through. But um, you will find some really good information here and you all get the slides. So, I mean, you can take notes, but a lot of this will be in there if you want it. And if you click on this link when you get it, I'm not going to do it now, but we have been trying to define fact checking at API and we are crowdsourcing it. Right now, the definition is three paragraphs long, and so we're it's, so it kind of shows you that it's a very um, hard discipline to to define. So let me get to what we're going to do today. So we're going to talk about setting up a fact-checking process. It's not something that you can just walk in the door of your newsroom one day and say, "I'm going to do fact-checking." Um, the best fact-checking resources. Many of you were um, very kind and filled out your surveys and um, like all the other workshops we've done, everyone is really interested in where to find the best resources um, for doing their fact checks and we have some really good ones. There are new ones every day and we're keeping up with those. Um, you will begin an actual fact check for, we hope, for publication. Um, we would love to see some actual published fact checks come out of these workshops. If you did not bring a fact or a statement to check with you, um, you have time during lunch to find one or two or three because that will be the hands-on part of this. And hopefully through all of this you will understand why fact-checking will help your news organizations. Um, I should have asked before, how many people in here are reporters? How many are students? Faculty? Uh, uh, editors or managers? Okay, great. Um, so a, a couple of points I'll be talking just to the editors and managers. So um, just be aware of that. So um, I wanted to um, turn this over to Sarah so she can talk a little bit about the research. Um, and not, I mean, we're not going to go in depth on research. I know you didn't come here for you know science, but um, <laughs> but we wanted to show you that there is science behind this and that you do have an impact in what you do. Thanks, Jane. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. So. Um, there's a lot of excitement around this project and around this sort of nationwide tour that Jane is on. And among the researchers as well, um, who have produced some really exciting uh, research showing the impact of fact checking, the um, call for fact checking, and sort of what you can accomplish um, through this process. So I'm sure a lot of people in this room had the frustration of wanting to, of having to report on some sort of political discourse that maybe is bending the truth. A politician said something where you might have questioned whether it was true, but you reported it because that's your job. Um, and that's frustrating. And the audience is frustrated too, um, because they know. They know that that's happening. So um, NPR did a study of 5,000 uh, respondents, and 75% um, of them said that they wanted more fact-checking. This graph is showing you that of all of the things that um, were offered to them in terms of what they could get in, more, in their political reporting, fact checking was the number one thing that they wanted. So the audience wants fact checking more than anything, more than information about positions, more than policy statements, more than all these other things. Now, you can say, okay, NPR has a specific audience and that's probably true, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. People are, people are paying attention and people are, are recognizing that it's not always um, it's not always enough just to report what politicians are saying, as I'm sure you know better than anyone. Um, and it, uh, readers are impressed. Again, here's a um, one of the studies that's being done by our um, researchers affiliated with the project. And she found that um, when there's fact checking, which is this first bar, correction via journalistic arbitration, um, that has the highest level, the highest rating of approval by readers. Correction via he says, she says, so just, um, you know, a traditional balance, right, where you say, okay, well, this person said this, but this person said this, that, not as much, 
and then no correction, um, not as much at either. Can I, can I just yeah. interrupt with my annotations in here? Yes. Usually I don't have a researcher with me to explain these things, so, <laughs> so and I'm not a researcher, I'm just a journalist, and uh, so I have to explain what correction via journalistic arbitration means, so <laughs> I have, oh, wait a minute, How, did I do Yeah, that? no, go forward. Okay, so fact checking, that's, that's correction via journalistic arbitration, that is fact checking. He said, she said, is lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and no correction at all is super lazy. That's, that's my definition. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't want to be responsible for saying that. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but readers are impressed, okay? It makes, it, it makes an impact, and they appreciate it. Um, and it has an impact on politicians as well. Um, so another academic study that's being done by people affiliated with this project found that um, in three different conditions, in three different groups, there was a, a group of politicians who were sent letters, told that um, there's a fact-checking outlet, a PolitiFact outlet in their state, and they were going to be paying attention to what they said during this upcoming campaign. Another group was told that um, they were maybe studied, sort of a generic, and then another group didn't receive any letter at all. The politicians who knew that there was fact-checking going on in their communities, and knew that there was a PolitiFact outlet, knew that reporters around them were paying attention, were far less likely to say something that was untrue and to be given a bad rating by the fact-checking outlets that were in their, in their areas, in their communities. So candidates pay attention and it helps. It strengthens the political discourse in the end. So with that in mind, um, we're gonna walk you through now um, the different tools that you can use um, and the guiding keywords that Jane will tell you about right now. Okay. So, um, especially with the impact on politicians, I know sometimes you guys will do stories or fact checks or just regular stories, and um, and then you find that the politicians are still behaving in the same way. They're still repeating that lie, even after you after you've proven that it's false, and it's very discouraging. But there is an impact, and for for every person you don't reach, there are others that you do reach. And I skipped over this slide before I started to say why we were doing it now. Um, you know, this is a really, really good time to be a fact checker if your newsrooms are so inclined to, to really put some resources behind that because there is an incredible rise in misinformation. And with the rise in misinformation, we are really obligated to increase accordingly our fact checking. Um, there's more money spent on campaign ads and more campaign ads means more bad campaign ads. Social media is just an incredible source of misinformation. And we are not keeping up as journalists. And this is why we think this is so important. We really, really want to ramp up for 2016. Hey, Jane, can I just interject yeah. quickly? Um, we talk a lot today about fact checkers and fact checking. Um, but I do want to say, like, even if your organization is small and can't like label a reporter a, a fact checker, you can still do fact checking in your organization. And I would encourage you to consider a fact-checking story as one type of story that you have in your toolbox. So just the way you might do a meeting story, or if you were doing a trend story, or if you did a story where you wanted to find a person on the street to open your story. Um, think about, there are gonna be times when you're out covering your beat when a fact-check story is appropriate and is a good tool to use. And um, so, I just don't want anyone to feel like this is only something you can do if you're a full-time fact checker. I see it as for um, reporters who are covering beats, who are just gonna, you know, sometimes you're gonna want to deploy the fact check story. So I would encourage you to think of it that way. That's that's a really good point, and I, I think that um, probably most of us in this room know that our news organizations are not gonna hire a couple of full-time fact checkers. So um, if you really have to be creative in how you do that. But it's exactly like Angie said, I think the only thing I would add is that the fact-checking reporter has to have some training and background. Um, so we put together, we actually have put together a policy and guidelines, a sample guidelines for any newsroom who wants to start a real fact-checking program. Um, and this is where you need to go back to your editors and tell them if they are interested in this, I can send it to them. Um, it's designed to be plug and play. Your newsroom can take it, adapt it for your staffing levels or whatever you need to do and just start using it. And it really contains 
a lot of what we're talking about today and, and a little bit more. So our guiding keywords in, in actually creating this presentation and the, um, the guidelines were these three things. Transparency is really important. You'll see that all throughout this presentation. You have to be transparent with your readers when you're doing fact checks. You have to tell them where you got the information, how you got the information, why you even chose the fact to check in the first place. Everything that you have in your research should also belong to the reader. Um, words, and this is something that we really got from PolitiFact, and their mantra is words are important. And maybe Angie can explain why, what that means exactly. Um, we say that words matter. Um, we uh, fact check a lot of things where the defense of the erroneous claim is, well, people knew what I meant. Mm -hmm. And we say, you know, no, that's not, uh, that's what you said um, needs to be literally true for it to get a positive rating on our truth -o meter. Um, a good example of this is there's an Iowa. Senate race where there's a Democratic congressman running and he said I voted to authorize strikes in Syria well that's actually not what Congress voted on they voted on um, being willing to arm opposition groups they didn't take a position on authorizing Obama to make strikes and it was a point of contention because some people say Congress was copping out by not voting directly on the strikes. So when he said he voted on strikes, we rated it false. The campaign came back and said, well, we think people knew what we meant. But we said, no, that's not, that's not right. And that's a good example of words mattering. Context matters too, um, but uh, I think more often the words, the words and looking at what they said, is it accurate or not, um, often takes precedence. And I, I think as journalists, you know, that should be something that's very obvious to us, but um, just a little personal aside, when I first got out of college, I couldn't find a newspaper job, so I went to work for an ad agency writing copy. And that's where I really learned how important each individual word was, because in ad copy, words are money. Every single word that you say on the radio or in the television, in a print ad, every piece of little space that you take up with a word, that cost you money and if that doesn't convince you that words are important nothing will and I, I think I've uh, used that so many times in my journalism career final thing is checklists has anybody in here ever heard of the checklist manifesto the book so I'm going to totally give uh, a horrible summary of the entire book but this is really good book and you should read it but um, basically is written by the doc a doctor in the 80s I think whose premise was that in, in medicine, in the medical profession, doctors use checklists to do everything from um, deciding how to treat a patient or deciding what kind of disease they have. And his point is that if doctors can use a checklist to save lives, then the rest of us in other professions can certainly use it in our profession. So we're really big on checklists and making sure that everything is done in the same way every time. So. Um, getting started. This is this is like the part that you have to go through. These are your vegetables. These, this is the stuff you have to do before you do a fact check. And we're going to take these one by one. First of all, set up a process. And I've just been talking about that. So you have to have a process in your newsroom. You have to have a very defensible process. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. It should be in writing. Everybody who does a fact check should do it in the same way. Designate a staff. We kind of talked about that a minute ago. Um, I think if you have a designated staff who does fact checks, even if they're not doing it full time, um, it makes it easier to train them um, so you don't have to train the whole staff. I mean, you can jumpstart your training by just taking a few people and um, showing them the right way to do fact checks. Um, and you don't get into a situation like in the last workshop I was in, somebody says, Well, we we don't really have a big staff, can we just have an intern do our fact checks? And it's like, no, you can't have an intern do your fact checks. I'm sorry if there are any interns in the room, but, but it's not something that anyone can do. You need experience and background and uh, some training. So get your archives in order. So how many of you, if you were to sit down and do a breaking news story right now, about a political campaign would know immediately where the last story 
you wrote, or the last story somebody else wrote at your news organization would be able to just grab that and get your hands on it. Some of you, that's good. And this is just really, really important. Um, the archive systems at some news organizations are a mess. And if you, especially for fact checking, you have to know what you have written, what you have said before. Um, so if your archives aren't in order, you need to get a system to do that. Um, have your data and resources at hand. Again, um, if some of you in here are beat reporters or cover a, a beat uh, on a typical basis, you probably have like some go-to websites that you usually go to, right? That, you know, some sources, some people. How many of you have that in a place like an electronic Rolodex or something mm -hmm. that you can actually get to really, really fast and keep it updated? Okay, that's good. But with fact checking, there are so many resources that you really, really need a system. It can't be just a Word document or a pile of papers on your desk. And I think you guys can attest to that. You just really have to have these things in order. So um, I promised you that we had some great resources for you. It's not something that we're going to be able to go to in depth right now, maybe during the hands-on exercises. But I wanted to go over a couple of them. The first one, which somehow got to be in purple, and I don't know why, but the first <laughs> one is um, the American Press Institute's resource page. We actually have a really good freelancer who is building this page for us, and every week she is putting in new resources based on what the news is. You know, if immigration is in the news, she's telling you where to go for immigration resources, and not only where to go, but how to use it, because some of these databases are really confusing. So she's giving you tips on step-by-step -step how to use these databases. So that is a great one. Um, factcheck.org has, um, does everybody know factcheck.org? Okay, they're, they're, again, a wonderful resource. Um, they have a resource list that they use to teach their students in the summer, I think grad students that they are teaching fact checking to. Um, this was not published anywhere. I just was handed a piece of paper with the resources. So I published it on my, I teach at OD at Old Dominion University and I published it on my classroom blog. So when you click on that link, you're gonna to go to my classroom blog, but I needed a place to publish it. So, but it is what factcheck.org uses and it's a great list of resources. Um, Money and State Politics. Um, this is a great organization. They're still inputting data, but you can actually, and I think I, uh, that will click through right to New Jersey um, to all the campaign contributions and campaign databases. Um, a great little known organization that, that's doing some really good work that will definitely help you out. Um, how to fact check resume. Vote Smart is another, I think, fairly new organization. I only put that in there because it's a really, really easy way to, um, to find campaign contributions in your state. It's just um, a really nice website. I don't know who their developers, but it's really good. And then we come to the New Jersey data book. Is it okay to do it now? Or do yeah, we can do it now. We can go to the database later. Do you want to do it that way? Just okay. That would be fine. So we have a real live database we're launching. I'm Angie McGuire, I'm from Rutgers, I saw some of you maybe in May at the uh, session that was hosted here at Montclair State, and we're delighted to be partnering with Montclair State on this. Um, this resource, is anybody familiar with the New Jersey Legislative District Data Book? Have you seen it before? If not, <coughs> just ask. Physical manifestation of the database which is what we've been publishing for 39 years. So we have 39 years of data that have been collected about the congressional and legislative districts in um, New Jersey. A couple of years ago, and I'm going to put my colleague on the spot here as he walks in, this is Alan Zalkin, who's going to Oh, okay. He just went to the other door there. As long as we're waiting for Alan, we've got some photographers here, and they want to get behind you, Joe. Um, so go ahead and walk across. And do it. Do it if you want to. Yeah. Just walk through here. I'm sorry to interrupt. Where, uh, which organization started this? And so this is created by the Rutgers 
Center for Government Services. Uh, there's a brief history on the website we're unveiling today here with Montclair State. Um, so you'll be able to get the full history, which is listed on the, um, it's on the website. Let me, let me see if I can just pull up now. This. What happens if you click on that? New Jersey name of that. I could go to the website there, but I'm just trying to pull up the little PowerPoint here. That you have? Yeah. Can we talk? Can everybody turn their phones to vibrate, please? Thank you. Thank Is you. that up there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Did you get yours? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the New Jersey Day Book was created by the Center for Government Services as a result of changes in the Constitution. For 70, a little over 70 years, the congressional legislative districts of the state aligned with the county lines. And so our elected officials received data about their constituents because it was reported in a county line. But as the Constitution changed and more congressional districts were added, more legislative districts were added, the elected officials didn't have information about their constituents. That's the genesis of why this data was collected. So we could report it by a congressional legislative district. So for years we've published this book and it's been used by um, legislative services primarily. It's, as you can see if you flip through it, it's an incredible amount of data. It's been collected for 39 years. It is vetted with a very rigorous protocol at Rutgers, done it every year. And two years ago, I'm just going <laughs> to introduce Alan Zalkin, who walked in, who's also everybody. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> the director of the Center for uh, Government Services, had a vision that we really couldn't continue to publish something people couldn't use. And so we set about to create a database to make it accessible not just to legislators, but to all citizens, and importantly, to municipal and county governments. Because the book had evolved so far into legislative lines that it was very difficult to start finding municipal data. Even though that's what we were gathering, data, all these variables are gathered by municipality and pulled up into the larger database. So. This is the 2013 book that I just handed out to you. It was published last year. We're, we're in the midst of publishing what we hope is our last physical book. We're going to publish the 2014 book. We've always sold it. So again, that makes it less accessible when you have to collect revenue from it. Um, and it will be for sale. And the database that goes online today is not a fee for service. It's a, open to the public, provided as a public service by Rutgers University. And we're going to go to the website here, which is njdatabook.rutgers.edu. The um, municipal, what we changed over the last couple of years is rather than reporting just legislative and congressional data, we're now reporting it by municipality as well, and probably most importantly by municipality. So you'll see we were able to cut the database three different ways, county, legislative, and congressional district. We've also started adding a bunch of variables Last year we added additional variables on poverty, crime, and employment. So we're hoping that you begin your fact checking that this database is not only useful to you, but you'll start giving us feedback on the kinds of things that would be most helpful. You had a question? I was just curious to make sure I was understanding correctly about congressional districts. Uh, they're, they're chain, they change through time, right? So, so the time series are not great. The, the districts are moving about. So right. only the municipalities are staying constant? Right, which is why we felt we had to start reporting it multiple ways. So at each census point, you have changes in the landscape of congressional districts. And so that you have to have the historical view of that, and you can cut it at the municipal level as well. But so we, we, we cut it all three ways. But again, so the congressional districts do change, is that Yes, right? they okay, do. Good. Yes, Sorry. they do. Yeah, they do. Um, this initial version um, that we're going to show you a view of today um, has data from are the books that were published in 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014, exactly for the root problem you're talking about, which is the census data changes the boundaries. And so we wanted to get the initial version out, and we'll start loading the older data as we can reflect how the boundaries have changed in legislative and congressional districts. Okay, okay so here's the home website. The home, I can make it smaller even. So um, if you go into the About tab, about the data book, You'll see a history of the data book, which is, I think, what you were asking about. And does anybody know Dr. Ernie Reock from Rutgers University? He's uh, 89 years old. He's been working on the data book for all 39 years. He still comes in every day and assists us with adapting the protocol and the process to gather the data. One of the things we really stress with this data book is it's reliable. It comes from sources that can be checked. 
We check it, we vet it, we proofread it, which is the costly part of putting one of these things together. But because we have 39 years of data that follow a protocol, we feel confident that we have data that you can use, which is, again, one of the reasons we do it here. And you Oprah some of it. We have to Oprah more and more every year. It used to be we could go to our friends in Trenton who knew it was Rutgers University, we're the State University of New Jersey, and data would come to us. Or we used to even have to drive to Trenton to get some of it. More and more we got electronic files. And over the past two years, we've been required to Oprah things. We were, are surprised we have to Oprah. But we've gone ahead um, and established those processes as well so that we can, and they, and they know we're coming every year. Um, we still have data that um, is more difficult to gather. Like I, I mentioned, we added crime reporting. Yeah. And the state police are woefully slow in, in, with the UCRs for crime data. So we use FBI data, um, which is Ooh. coming out just a little quicker than state data, even though it's reported from the same sources but it does lag, so data that's available in 2013 is really a UCR for 2011. When you see how this database is organized, it's organized around the year of the event. So if we're reporting data about crime in 2011, because that's the most current UCR available, Uniform Crime Report, sorry if I didn't explain the acronym, it's because that's the most current published and reported as 2011 data. In the feature section here, what you can see is we have 11 indicators, I don't know if you can see all of that, that are currently available. There's actually 12 indicators, but not all of the school data is loaded yet. And each one of these, if you were to click on the feature, will give you a definition of what it is and what sources we use. We can always give you more detailed sources. We didn't put the links on these pages, but it's a description of what it is we're reporting and who provided the data. If you go into the, should I go ahead and go into the database now or you want to save that later for when we uh, have a development team here? Um, we can save that for later. Okay. We, can, we can fit it in. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just show you what happens here. Once you go into the database, the first step is you're selecting the ge geography by which to search the data. So I, if you can see these tabs, it's county, congressional, and legislative. Now, a lot of attempts at this um, have been made before, but they'll say pick three st cities to compare or pick two counties to compare or, or something like that. We elected to build this out originally with everything included. So if you pick Atlantic County, <coughs> it's gonna show you all of the municipalities in Atlantic County. It'll automatically click them all or you can unclick select all and just pick the cities you wanna look at in Atlantic County and compare them. Likewise, if you go to a congressional district, you're selecting which districts you want to look at. And within a district, it's going to tell you which counties are covered in that district, and within those counties, which cities. So you can select, I only want to look at um, Atlantic County in District 23, or in District 2. There are 23 cities in Atlantic County. I want to use all of them, and I will unclick Cape May County, and I will unclick Cumberland County. So it's given you a lot of flexibility to cut and look at data from a number of, of ways within a congressional district. Within a legislative district, same thing. You can pick whichever legislative district you want to look at. District 27, Essex County, there are eight municipalities within the legislative district, and in Morris County, there are another six. So you can look at any variation on that. So your first, your first cut is by geography, any way you want to look at it. You can select everything. You can select the whole state, every municipality, every legislative district, whichever way you want to cut it. Then in the second selection process, you're selecting the variables that you want to look at by choosing the indicator, which is the health or well-being of communities. Then within that indicator, the variables that you want to look at. Now the one limitation we still have is you can only look at one year of data at a time. So if you wanted to look at employment, the three variables that are, we have in the database for everything is workforce, unemployment, and percent unemployed. You can select them all. And then select the year you want to look at the data for. If you wanted to then download it, the function for downloading, well, let me just first show you the display. We'll talk about this more later when you want to use it for fact check. Oh, I meant to. It's not letting me. We'll, we'll 
we'll look at it later when you want to look at data checking. So it's a first step, second step. First pick your geography, cut it any way you want, then pick your variables and indicators, look at what you want to look at. Okay? And I think then you want to wait till later on in the session yeah, to I go thought, through. I thought what we might do, um, just assuming that some of you might want to use this data for your fact checks, that um, we can go over it a little bit more for lunchtime entertainment. And then while you're doing your hands-on fact checking, Angie can walk around and help you use the data too, if that makes sense. So. Okay. Good. Any questions, comments, feedback? I had I had a question, and I should have said before that if you have questions, you should ask now because we never know at the end if we're going to have a lot of time. Um, is any other state doing this? There is no other state doing this. Wow. Uh, we've had inquiries from a number of states of, could you build this for us? Well, the answer is, sure, we can build the database. <laughs> this was done by a team of Rutgers IT folks. Um, but the data is what's hard. Right. What's hard is feeding the data in. We have the advantage of starting with 39 years of data. So you could pick it up from where we are and go forward with it. Um, Pennsylvania captured data for a couple of years and published uh, sort of maps, visualization of the data, but had to stop because it's, it's difficult to fund the staff to do this kind of data collection. And Rutgers has done it as a public service, so we have that benefit. Do you have a plan to an API? We do. And actually, we thought we'd talk later when our development team is here, so you could ask about the platforms and things like that, and they'll be here. And and apparently, you have to register to use this. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. You do register to use it. That's so that we can send updates. It's in pre-release, as you can see. So you'll create a email and a login. When the next rev of the database is available, you'll get an email back saying, new data has been added, um, let you know, that kind of thing. So it's used just for notification and so that we can understand what's useful to people and what's not to help us focus. It's not for any other reason. Privacy statement at the bottom. <laughs> any other questions? We're, okay, so we're back We're back to our um, initial list and just a couple more in this list. How many people in this room use Google Docs in their, in their work life um, or Dropbox? So, or some other kind of document sharing. This is really important with fact checking and it goes back to the transparency. What we recommend um, as a best practice <coughs> is that you use Google Docs or Dropbox or something so that all of your documents, and reporters are gonna hate this, but we recommend that reporters' transcripts of their interviews, their notes, everything is available in a shared document for editors or whoever needs to see it. That is part of the transparency and it really protects you and it helps you. Um, and it's probably not the way you're used to working, but we think in fact checking is really important. What about though, if you have unnamed sources and things like that, you wouldn't want that in a document that's that's being shared. Well, so we w we're really recommending sharing it with um, your editors and your staff. Um, and I know, not but if you have it in any kind of a public record, mm -hmm. it's subpoenaable, right? I mean, isn't it, it, don't you put yourself more at risk for that kind of thing? I'm not sure what the laws are in, in this state, but you would have to pay attention to those laws. If you do have um, unnamed sources, that's that's a different discussion. But as well, far as... Jane, would they have unnamed sources for fact-checking, though? Maybe not. I'm just saying, I if, mean, you're, if, you're, if you're making it as a regular reporter hygiene to be doing a lot of making everything transparent, um, to be get using Google, your drive to be sending the stuff back and forth for editors, we're getting different um, kind of coaching from people on you know the Edward Snowden kind of stuff, where where which is as you're happening more and more at a local level, people have to be worried about their sources. Yeah, so I'm just wondering if you know you really, and then if you only say say you send everything to reporter to your editor on all your all your fact checking, all your notes all the time. And then you held something back. I mean, it, it, I, I just, I think it... it Let's it, get this question first yeah, and then yeah. go to Angie. Actually, there was a comment on that. There's, yeah. there's a for bo Dropbox I use, it's called Box Cryptor. Uh-huh. And it encrypts all that information, so it gives it one level of security. Mm. And the other one is a secure drop, which is what Wikileaks used, and it's actually an open source software okay. that is used for anonymous. Like, so if you have an anonymous source, Mm -hmm. that you want to send to you. Uh, right. It can be done and it's stored, but it's encrypted. Right. So there are ways so to do that. So it's box cryptor and what's the other one? Secure drop. Secure drop. So I would say in fact checking that because we are so interested in transparency, there aren't going to be a lot of occasions where you're going to have an anonymous 
source because you're what you're trying to do with fact checking is get to the facts and go back to your original sources. I'm not saying it could happen. No, obviously. but I'm just saying suppose like the fact is something that someone within the government has in their possession and they want to give to you and it's an actual document. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. Well then That's the document is your source. I mean I would never use an unnamed source or an anonymous source in a fact check report. It's just it's not worth it. People don't believe it. Um, no, that's that's I can, know, I can understand I mean, that, but you may be doing both, like you said. Your, yeah. your arsenal includes the fact check story. If you're you're a hundred percent right. fact checker, but if you're a reporter doing all kinds of things, fact checking may be ten percent of what you do. And if you're using anonymous sources to develop stories, you right? Know but I, I think then that's not fact checking. That's investigative okay. reporting. That's you know that's, that's you know, kind of it's a different, different situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different situation. I mean with. I, I have to tell you, like the level of skepticism that people have is is so high right mm -hmm. now. And even with investigative reporting, if you're using unnamed or anonymous sources, you're going to have a significant segment of your audience that's like, yeah, right. Um, so with fact checking, I would in avoid in entirely using any sort of anonymous or unnamed source. Um, one of the issues that we face is that campaigns will ask us, they'll say, well, can I talk to you off the record? Right. And we're doing a fact check source. My usual answer to them is, um, you know, I'll listen to what you say off the record, but anything that goes into my report has to be um, has to be documented, has to be on the record. Um, and usually, usually, um, the campaign people are just sensitive about being quoted, so they just want to be able to present their case in their own words. And it's not. It usually doesn't present problems. Now, some of the fact checkers in our organization are more strict than that, and will say, "No, I won't even talk to you um, off the record." I mean, this is this is an area where um, you know you get into some issues of, of source relationships. You know, I want people to be able to feel like they can talk to me without literally quoting every word. In some cases, um, but anything that goes into the report needs to be on the record. If they want to comment in the report, it needs to be on the record. If it's I don't want to belabor that and, point. Yeah, and Angie brings up a good point. Actually, one of Angie's colleagues helped me uh, give this presentation at SPJ. I don't know if anybody was at SPJ in Nashville this year. Um, and he made the point, He he's a reporter who used to cover a number of different beats, and now he's a full-time PolitiFact reporter for PolitiFact Virginia. And he said um, that this, this job is the job where he gets the most hate mail, hmm. comments, phone calls, emails, so much that you can barely keep up with it. More than any other beat that yeah. he's ever no, covered. No, he's never covered pets. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that, you know, it, that brings up the point for transparency too and for being able to defend every single thing that you do. And, I, and we'll go into this in a couple other slides, but I, I hate to say that you're in a defensive posture, but you are. And you always need to remember that you have to defend everything that you do, or your work will be not effective. Can I, can I just want to say one more thing on the document sharing? Because we've had these discussions internally. I think you need to think about, I mean, is it possible for, you know, the government to get into Google Docs and look at them? You know, I think we have to be open to the possibility that yes, it is. But I'm not really worried about the NSA seeing the drafts from my working fact checks. I mean, because that's just like, that's a different type of reporting. I mean, clearly the New York Times and the Washington Post reporters who are beat reporters on national security need to be concerned about that. But for us, um, it's not such an issue. And the, and the convenience of the document sharing um, kind of outweighs those concerns. But again, that's because of the specific context that we're reporting in. And I think you always need to be thinking about, like, what context am I reporting in? Who am I, who am I concerned about? seeing things pre-publication and who am I not. We also use dual sign-in. If you use Google Documents, you really should enable the dual mm -hmm. sign-in. It's in the security settings. Mm -hmm. And what that means is you won't be able, you nor anybody else will be able to sign into your account with your password unless they also have your phone mm -hmm. and get a code through your phone. Um, that makes it really um, strong to have that double system. And you know, I thought you, I thought you were asking um, if if this was a secure system. And no, it's not. Yes, they can they can hack into Google Docs. And I worked for the Washington Post before I went to API, and we considered using um, Gmail and Google Docs, and we 
um, dismiss that idea because of the security problems. But for fact checking, I think a shared document process of some type is important. And I'd say if somebody hacks it, everything in there should be substantiated, so you should be okay. Um, okay, know the tools. So this this is another thing that many of you ask for in your surveys, and um, it's kind of a popular thing when we do these workshops. I will preface this by saying that some of these tools, probably most of these tools, are under development. They're not perfect, but they are fun to play with, and one day they will be perfect. So it's good to keep up with the, the actual um, the tools out there that can help you do your fact checking. And we'll go through a couple of them. So many of the tools on this list, which again you'll get, um, are from Storyful. Does everybody know what Storyful is? Storyful is an organization that really got its start um, during the Arab Spring when there was a lot of misinformation, especially on social media, that had to be ver verified. So they created tools um, and created actually a business um, on verifying information. They sell their services to news organization, kind of like AP or something. So you can actually sign up to be part of Storyful and they will do your verification processes for you. Um, I don't know how much it costs, but um, these are some of their favorite tools. TinEye, has anybody used TinEye before? Do you want to explain how it works? Yeah, I think this is like the coolest it's, thing. It's just a reverse image search. So you upload a, you either upload an image or you um, po post the URL to the image and it will um, trace matches. Uh, so you, it helps you source images. So if somebody send, sends you a photo and says it's of this particular incident, um, you know, you can use it to, to see if that image has been used elsewhere. Um, I remember seeing, I think, a couple of uh, Hurricane Sandy images were debunked using technology oh. like this. Because yeah. I think there's the, the one of the shark uh, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that was actually just a, 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 a composite of some great yeah. images. It just kind of gives you a really cool history of the picture from its if if it's you know if it's in the database from its very beginning, the first time it was used, and, and where else it was used. So you can see it would be good for the Arab Spring verification process. For political fact-checking, maybe. I mean, can anybody think of a reason to use uh, an image search in your political fact-checking? I know the mom jeans pictures. <laughs> <laughs> any, anything that's any ad, any photo that's used in an ad that you're suspicious of, maybe the origins. Um, would probably probably work for this, but other than that, um, you know, there's not too many. Um, Skeptive and Fiskit. Excuse me for the. Can I? I think Google has the same kind of thing. The reverse image search it for does. Google. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the image roll and you put it in. And yeah, they're they're complementary. I've used them. Sometimes I've used them both. One right. like one didn't work, and the other one did. But yeah, you can, you can use Google service too. Um, Skeptive and Fiskit. Again, these are two that are in development. But again, I think really cool things. Skeptive.com, if you want to play with that later. Um, this is a plugin for your browser. So you get to choose the sources you trust. Say you like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. You plug that into the, the back end of the database. And then you just go about your business just searching the internet and whatever. And if you're reading a story, and something in that story does not match your trusted sources like the Wall Street Journal or Washington Post or whatever, it starts flaming in red. So <laughs> any fact in there that, that is not quite right or doesn't match your trusted sources, um, you can click on it. It'll go to the source and you can see what the problem is. I think it's really cool. I think it's probably really good for copy desk. Um, and it might be something that you can work into your everyday reporting. Snopes, does everybody know what oh, Snopes yes. is? Okay, everybody, they're, they're like the original fact checkers, right? Um, very reclusive people. Does anybody know their background? It's, it's interesting story, and I've, I've been trying to interview them and they won't respond to me, but they're very reclusive. It's a couple who lives in California. I understand they live in a trailer park in California, and they've been doing this for years, obviously, and they have a website and they make a little bit of money off their website, but. Um, if you look at Snopes, they do more than politics. In fact, they don't really do that much in politics, but they do everything else. But it's always worth a check to see if they have done a fact check on a subject that you're interested in. Um, Spokio, Ice Rocket, Zava Search. Anybody use any of those? Spokio? Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
Spokio. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys do you have an account with them, a paid account? I mean, I have heard that it's worth getting the paid account. It's not a whole lot of money, but it's a people search, and it's kind of scary. Like all of these are kind of scary, really. You put somebody's name in, and you get like their entire social media history, their name, their wife's name, their age, where they were born, where they live, um, all the places that they used to live. Uh, their kids' names, everything is in there. So it's just a um, very robust people search. I think all of these um, have paid versions and free versions. Um, it's are better those, than your basic people search. Are those um, reliable enough to be using? I would say person? nothing is reliable. <laughs> so, uh, and we'll get into this. I mean, when you fact check, you have to fact check your fact check. So you, it's a good starting point. It's kind of like Wikipedia, which we do not trust, right? So, but it's a, it's a good um, signpost to sort of put you in the right direction. Although Spokio, I know a lot of news organizations use the paid version and, and they, um, they like it. So um, it's something to look at. Wolfram Alpha, anybody use that? Um, so this is my quick definition. This, they, it's, this is like a massive database of databases and they're always putting more databases in there. So you can go in there, it's a very, very plain looking page search engine and you type in something like, what was the weather in Montclair, New Jersey on September 14th, 1982? And you get the answer like that. So um, again, um, it doesn't work for all questions, but it works for a lot of questions and it just makes your searching much more efficient. And of course, you all know about Google Maps, Google Earth, and, and Google Translate, which again, came in very handy for the story full people. And this is their, this is their list of favorites. So, so, um, so we're getting to the end of our list. Establish your social media accounts for your fact-checking projects before you actually start fact-checking. Um, we recommend that you do have a separate social media account for political fact-checking or um, for your fact-checking brand, which, you know, again, we hope that you have a brand and, and um, something that you can really promote. And, Along with establishing your social media accounts, we recommend that you have social media training. How many in here have had actual social media training to use in your work? That's, that's good. Um, I would say do it again because things are changing all the time. And you know, it's one thing to say, well, I tweet, but you have to know how to tweet effectively and you have to know which social media um, platforms are best for for your work, and you have to test that. Do you recommend any uh, specific programs, trainings, readings on non-social media use? Um, there are a lot of tutorials. There's. Does any, do you guys have access to Lynda.com on campus? Is it free? It? I know at my college <coughs> we give it. Lynda.com. Lynda.com. No, I am. It's it's absolutely free for students at, at my at the Probably. college where I teach. Um, I would also point you to the Pointer Institute. Mm -hmm. Pointer.org does a lot of webinars. Of, I mean, they're not free, but they're most of them are pretty low cost, and they do a lot of things on on mobile and social media. So, what is the connection in terms of why a separate social media account for this? Is it in terms of you putting things out and branding it, or is it in terms of you it, using it to troll and for? I mean, to me, it's it's branding. I mean, Politifact obviously has a Politifact account. They are Politifact. That's all they do. But if you're a newsroom that does a lot of different things, and you really want to promote your fact checking, which is really a good selling point for your news organization, you want to brand it, and branding it means almost requires you to have separate social media. And I think that um, PolitiFact has found that Facebook is good for some things and and Twitter is good for other things. So you really have to know your audience. Yeah, you know, I think this is actually can be somewhat of a tricky question um, because let's say you're in a news organization and you don't know how often you're going to be able to fact check, you know. I mean, I would say in that case it might not make sense to create separate social media, but I do think you want to brand it somehow. And when I say brand, I mean something as simple as labeling it a fact check. Like if, if I was at a small newspaper and I wanted to bring more fact checking into my work, I would have a conversation with my editor and say, can we make the headline on the story like fact check? Or could we put a tag on the story the way they do analysis and make sure it says fact check? 
And when we tweet it out from the institutional account, can we make sure that we say fact check? Um, because I do think I do think you need to be giving those cues. The, the 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 only reason I'm even slightly disagreeing with Jane here is because I think if you have an established social media presence, um, you, you want to use the most powerful tool you have to blast it out. I mean, when we started Politifact, it caught on really quickly in social media. We were kind of we were we were in social media early. I mean, we were tweeting in 2000. 2008 um, but uh, if you already have a big institutional account um, you know maybe you should tweet it out through there I mean I do think um, the bigger you're trying to reach the biggest audience you can through social media so you might want you know or you can also you can also tweet it out two ways like we'll tweet with PolitiFact Florida and then the Tampa Bay Times will also tweet it does that make sense the other thing about social media training is it helps you find story ideas. How many of you uh, check social media um, candidates' social media accounts for facts to check? Or oh, yeah. yeah. So I know when Lou Jacobson, one of um, Angie's colleagues, was helping present this workshop, he was talking about every morning he sits down. The first thing he does is check Twitter and Facebook and, and what the candidates are saying because he gets story ideas and fact check ideas from there, too. Oh, let me interject one more thing. Um, I, I talk a lot about Twitter. I like Twitter a lot. I'm on Twitter. It's, it's where a lot of media people are. But I can tell you, looking at the metrics on our site, people reading your stories, much more comes from Facebook, and I'm always having to, so like think about Facebook especially, um, and think about if, you're, if your publication already has a sizable Facebook presence, you know, using it there. Um, because people, you know, pe we're getting those, Facebook is more powerful than Twitter as far as getting people to read your stories. Look at look at Politifact's um, Facebook account sometime and see how many shares they have. It's really impressive. So um, that's that is a good um, place for them to be. Um, okay, take a search tutorial. So um, again, this turned to purple. I don't know why it's supposed to be white, but anyway, if you <laughs> click on that link, there is a really good Google-sponsored advanced Google search tutorial. And I'm really stressing this because I think that most of us have never ever had any kind of training in Google searching, right? We just uh -huh. we just go to Google, and, <laughs> and then we find out that we've been doing it wrong the whole time. I mean, that there is a good way to do it, and there's an efficient way to do it. And um, I think everyone everyone should take this tutorial like once a year because they keep updating it. Um, we actually talked to the um, the Google people um, at ONA last month about doing a tutorial for um, younger people because even elementary school kids are Googling now and this is where the bad habits start. Um, should I play my video or not, Sam? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is just like a humorous interlude which you probably don't have time to, but I'm gonna play it anyway. So I should preface this by saying that PolitiFact has a hater and it's Rachel Maddow. <laughs> so um, anyway, if you ever get a chance, go to, to Rachel Maddow's site and search for PolitiFact and see her rants about PolitiFact, and Angie can probably talk about that later, <laughs> but um, this is a clip of her rant and then our response to it. Fact checking is a noble thing. The desire to independently verify facts that you hear in news and political conversation, that is a noble impulse and everybody should do it. Honestly, third graders who can spell Google can do it alone without help. So we went to some third graders. <laughs> the smart ones. Was President Obama born in Africa? And I'm trying to find out. So we just gave them some birth <laughs> questions. Now look at the first site she calls up because it's the it's a birther site. Oh. It's the first site that came up. So she thinks that's it. Probably true. False. So it says that that his actual birthplace is not Hawaii, but Kenya. The nice water really killed your dog. <laughs> so I didn't really find the answer, but um, 
Thanks for watching. <laughs> Checking is a normal thing. Anyway, okay, Rachel, that's enough. Um, <laughs> so why is she why is she so against it? What's do you want to explain? <laughs> It's maybe not. Is she not, does she not like it when liberals are found to be lying? She has had some arguments with some of our ratings. Um, she, we have a rating called Half True, and she particularly doesn't like that one. And I, I have to tell you, like we get a lot of response from readers. We use a rating. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. Um, some people really don't like that Half True rating. They're saying things are true or they're false, and. You know, when you say, like, there's something here in between, a lot of people, you know, just react negatively against that. I mean, that's what I would say. So she doesn't like that when she thinks that somebody's uh, lying, that, you, that, they're, that they're getting half credit for, for telling the truth? Oh, I think she says that, like, oh, we just pegged, I think she would, you know, would say we pegged it wrong. You know, there's some other ratings. Like, we fact-checked her, too, and she <laughs> doesn't, she doesn't. But like it's that. good to have haters, you know. That's <laughs> yeah. I mean, that means you, you know. have arrived if you have. <laughs> I mean, I will tell you when you fact check, you need to expect to get emails or phone calls for someone who tells you you got it completely wrong because the partisan atmosphere is so intense right now that like there there are people on on the extreme ends of the spectrum who just don't want to hear it and they're going to let you know. Uh -huh. Again, just really important that you have a defensible process. So we talked about creating branding and formatting, and you know, depending on the extent that your newsroom is going to go into this, I, I do really think it's important to have a consistent labeling, which means you have to come up with a title and probably a little icon or something to, to go with it. Um, anybody recognize this? Anyone? Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> This ruins my whole argument. This is a Washington Post fact checker. And most, most people, I guess you have to be in D.C. To, I, to be into this, but most people see that and they know it's a Washington Post fact checker. What about this? What is that? PolitiFact. So good, PolitiFact. <laughs> so everybody knows that. And this, I mean, this is what branding does for you. Um, Arizona Fact Check has, um, has their label and they have five stuff five four stars um, and everything is always consistent and always looks the same um, then we get to factcheck.org that does not have um, they don't have big branding and they don't have a rating system and um, they will tell you that they they just don't believe in rating systems because they feel like they need to present um, all the facts and, and assess it and then you can you can be the judge of what the rating should be, um, and they will explain it in much more detail than I would. They don't want to be in a position of saying somebody's lying or somebody's not lying. That's what they feel like they're doing. Um, but I think they're they're one of the few that don't have any ratings at all. Instead of having ratings, if you know if that isn't going to fly in your newsroom, you could go to labels. Um, labels and ratings are not the same thing. You can label it as misleading or um, needs uh, needs more detail or something like that. Um, but maybe Angie, you want to explain you the Politifax argument for having ratings? Yeah, we like ratings because they're a simple way that people can immediately access the fact check. Like they see the rating right off the bat. So they have kind of almost like a, a framework or, a, I mean, I consider the ratings like the front door. So like people approach it, they see like, oh, this is false or oh, this is true. And then they can um, have that understanding as they read the check. I think it helps. I think it makes some of the, some of the things we write about are really complicated or even dry. And I think the ratings bring a lot of clarity. Um, I compare them to like uh, uh, the letter grades on restaurant reviews, you know? Just because I see that this restaurant got an A or an F doesn't mean I'm not going to read the review. I mean, in some ways, it makes it's going to make me more likely to read the review. So um, I, the other issue is that a lot of people just want to pull it down for them. You know, they do. There is, if you don't have a rating, the people read your story, and they have to do a certain amount of mental work to kind of reach their own conclusion. I think factcheck.org would say that they're trying to encourage that sort of mental work. Um, but with us, you know, I think some people like 
get into that and they're like, this is too long, I don't know where this report is going, I don't understand what it's trying to tell me, and they just kind of bail on you. And I will say that factcheck.org has started putting in their very first paragraph, they will do an assessment. So it's not a rating, but they're putting it right there so people have that immediately. And I will mention that we also, one of our research projects that API is doing that will be ready in the spring has to do with ratings. And so that will be really interesting to see the impact of that. Do you have a question? No, I was just going to, she answered it. I was going to say, okay. if you guys find that they don't read the article, then if they just see the label, it's false, and then move on as if, like, I can tell you, it's covered. A lot of campaign people do not read the right. read it. Right. They just hear about it because like, it's like, how could you label this false? You didn't understand the blah 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 blah. And it's like, well, actually, your blah 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 was right in our story, and it, but it didn't outweigh the other factors. If you read it, you would see that we totally addressed your point. Um, That's what so, mostly true could work. I mean, because then you actually force well, it's mostly true. Why is it mostly true instead of labeling a creature or false? They might actually work. right. Yeah. Um, the other benefit to our ratings is that over the long term we can analyze them so we can see which talking points are like um, which talking points are being repeated that are the most wrong. I mean, so there's like there's a benefit to you to write in trend stories if you if you rate the claims because you're assigning this relative accuracy and you can track that over time. So, so a question on that on, on over time, do you only track claims specific claims or do you track politicians? In other words, would you have a rating on Christie? Well, at PolitiFact, what we have is we call it scorecard. Okay. So if you go to, like, there's a Chris Christie page on the PolitiFact site. Okay. You can go to it. You can see everything we've ever fact-checked on him. Um, we used to have a, a formal partner in New Jersey, um, the, the Star Ledger. That partnership ended, um, but the New Jersey content is all still there that you can look mm -hmm. at whenever you like. And was there a question? I guess, you know, something that hasn't, that isn't being mentioned here, uh, you know, but it's fine because we're trying to get through the material. The subject matter matters a great deal. So I know a little bit about finance, and I know that even if you, one, reporters probably don't have the depth to do it, and two, the data that's underlying it is often, I mean, the budgets themselves are very complicated or uh, economics. So you're not, you know, putting a rating scale on it, I mean, you're nuts, because, you know, there's just not enough horsepower to figure out what's the yeah. uh, underlying data. So, so there, you have to have a little distinction between what you're talking about, you know, where people are born. That's one thing. That's yeah. but facts, and the other things about employment or, you know, finances are really quite subtle. Uh, Sometimes we won't rate things. We'll say like we, you know, we'll just write a story on it, and we'll say like we we saw this claim, we looked into it. It's too complicated to draw a firm conclusion, but here are our findings. We'll certainly do that. I mean, if something is, if we don't feel confident enough to put a rating on something, we won't do it. Um, so I mean, you never want to like force a rating that you didn't feel comfortable. Right. I mean, you don't want to waste your work if you get in, if you do all this uh, research and then you can't come up with a rating that's fair. Um, then just write a story. I mean, we're going to talk about the best facts to check in a minute, and maybe that will help um, keep you out of those situations. But if you have if you have ratings, that is part of your brand, and you should try to have ratings when you can. Um, Glenn Kessler, former colleague of mine at the Post, who does the Pinocchios. He will tell, he's told me and he will tell you, he hates his rating system. He hates the Pinocchios. He's known for the Pinocchios and he hates them. But he has come to realize that that is why people read his stuff, because that, that is his branding. And he calls it a gimmick and it is a gimmick. But, um, you know, is that is that bad if, you, if it gets people into your content? I would say it's a useful gimmick because it really tells you when something is really wrong. Like, people will say, oh, he gave it four Pinocchios, it's worth just rating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing that you need to be aware of while we're talking about ratings is, and we're in political season, is to be careful about um, distinguishing between accuracy and fairness. Because sometimes an ad can strike you as really unfair and it can still be accurate. Now, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's unfair and it's misleading because it lacks context. Um, but uh, but there might still be some accuracy there. We've seen some fact checkers who do separate ratings for accuracy and fairness. Um, we still, we at PolitiFact, we look at fairness primarily in terms of context, like is the full context here? Because usually if something seems unfair, it's often missing critical context that would explain it, but not all the time. And sometimes like you just need to say like, this is an accurate claim. It may be, um, you know, 
it, it may strike some of your readers as like, you know, or as getting the yeah, but reaction, but accurate is accurate, so. And again, most people in this room cannot go back and, you know, do your own branding and say this is what we're going to do, but at least you have some in information to go back and have a discussion with your editors about um, about how to do what you're doing a little bit differently. How many people here have done video fact checks? Not, not fact checks on video ads, but um, a fact check in the form of a video? You have, okay. Are you with a TV station? No. So I, if, I thought if we had a bunch of TV people in the room, we would do this. I'm gonna kind of skip over this, but factcheck.org um, also has on their site a really good tutorial about the best practices if you're going to do a fact check in the form of a video. There's some very specific ways that, that you should do it, and um, they have done a good job of laying that out. You also have it in your packets, but um, I think in the interest of time, um, we're just going to skip over this part. Um, but I will say that the main point um, in, in their recommendations is, I think the big takeaway for us in this room, is don't play the entire bad video. If you are fact checking a, a campaign ad, um, TV ad, and especially if you found it to be false, do not put it on your website and play it in its entirety. And I see that all the time. And sometimes you, when you click on the story, um, it starts playing in the player automatically. You do not want to do that. So resist the temptation to put that entire video uh, within your story. You can link to it. Obviously, you're going to have to do that. Or you can take a small clip. Um, and if you are going to do that and go to the trouble of um, re-editing the video, these are the tips for you. Um, okay, so this is just sort of a basic uh, summary of, of how to present your fact check after you finished it. Again, don't use a video ad. Be consistent in your titling. Um, when you put your fact check up on the web, if you have a rating system, it should be concurrent. It should be alongside of your, of your actual narrative. Um, if you don't use a rating system, like factcheck.org, put your assessment in the first paragraph or two and agree on a standard length. This is really important because what's going to happen if you do a fact check on one party that's 10 inches and a fact check on another party that's 30 inches? You, you, ha you can't defend that. So you, you have to have a defensible process. So try to stick to uh, a standard length in all of your fact checks. and for inconclusive fact checks, as we just talked about, think about doing um, a regular story instead. Um, don't waste your work. So you guys were supposed to bring in some statements to check. I'm just going to assume that you did it, and we're going to go into looking at some of those now. So looking at the, um, looking at the fact checks that you brought in or that you meant to bring in, um, where did you find those? Give me some ideas for sources. We're going to put these up on the board, I think. Where, did you, where do you find statements to check? I covered Governor Christie's. I wanted to fact check something he said, and something that was also repeated by a, a commission he put together to look at the state's pension problem. So, so where, where did he say it? He said it in an event. He said it in multiple events. It's something he keeps repeating, but it's also okay. something that his committee, his commission, put in a report that came out recently. OK, so events. Where else? Just regular news articles from uh, from local outlets. So other people's work. Okay. Okay. What else? Anyone? There's like reports that come out. So in fact, like a like a state, like a, like a state puts out a report. Like a state of a state report or something. Okay. Or even like on topic like this is a pension status. So, like a white paper or something like that. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Or commission. The state puts together Commit. a lot of commissions and task forces. So okay. Like issues. What else? The ads, political ads. Right? Do, yeah, obviously political ads, but in print, radio. Mm -hmm. How many of you listen to the radio, like regular radio? Okay. I mean, there's a. Lot, I mean, at this time of year, there's a lot of. Very strange ads out there. What else? From the Oprah records, a lot of the times, especially 
email correspondence, is it? Oh, so so proactively going after some. Well, just like when you get a pull pro an email correspondence because you want something, then in there's some state of something that's on the record. Okay. And by the way, I just figured out what Oprah meant. I was oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sorry. What could this possibly mean? <laughs> and then finally figured it out. Yeah, it doesn't mean you get cars. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Um, interviews. We got a lot of good fact checks for Florida, and I, I edit our Florida fact checking whenever a Florida politician is on, like Meet the Press or Face the Nation. Mm -hmm. Almost always oh, so get talk, like, talk like TV. Yeah, like unscripted interviews okay. are really good where they can't, where they, you know, they can't just read off a paper or whatever. Yeah, okay. Debates. Oh, yeah. Debates. Debates. Yeah, definitely debates. Press releases. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Slash and press conferences. Um, what about all those mailings that you get? Oh, in the yeah. Yeah. Mail yeah. Yeah. What do you guys do with those? Spoken through. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I save them and bring them into the, like, because I live in the area we cover, but I don't write about it. So yeah. I save yeah. them and bring them into the yeah, borders really I good. cover it. Yeah. So those that, those have some of the most amazing claims on them. And I think <laughs> it's because they think it won't make it out of the house. And at the Post, we were all asked to, because we all live in Virginia, Maryland, D.C., you know, God knows where, we were all asked to bring in all the mailings <laughs> and just throw them on the political yeah. reporter's desk. And it was a really good resource to see what, what they were up to. Melissa, does everybody do that? Or is that just? Not a, surprisingly a large number of our staff don't live in our coverage area. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, what about fundraising events that you're not invited to? How would you handle that? I mean, as we all know, things happen at those events. So how would you handle that? That, that you... I mean, how would you get it? How would you get the discussion, the conversation? Sometimes you can talk to, like, if, you, if it's a candidate you're following all the time, sometimes you'll know people that regularly attend these things, you can call as a source. Or, like, yeah. if, um, sometimes, it, like, social media now is great people post pictures, and, and they'll, like, live tweet things that are at. Like, even though they're not a reporter, people will be like, oh, Governor Christie just said this, that fundraiser. Yeah. So it's a guidepost. It's not something you can use factually, but it is a good guidepost. What What's the law about two-way recording in this state? No, only as long as one person knows, you're yeah. fine. So there you have recording. It. <laughs> <laughs> Skype is wonderful for that, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, you could just get somebody a recorder and they can stick it in their pocket. Just a thought. So, um, how many use Google Alerts to yeah. oh, right. find out things? It, it's a little bit inefficient, but you can really get some good stuff on that. So, um, what about crowdsourcing? Do any of your news organizations ask your readers to send in statements to check? It, it can be, that can be a really good idea. It makes you uh, look like you're very connected to your community, but you have to have somebody on the other end who's willing to open all those emails and sort through the crap to find something good. So I think it's a great idea if you have the staffing to do it. So these are, these are ways you can find the fact checks and uh, statements to check, and I would say be careful about ignoring any, any one of those. Um, and now, well, let me ask you something yeah. I just saw last night um, online. Um, so there was a very controversial um, uh, thing in, in um, Sayreville. They canceled the whole football season. I saw that okay. on TV last night. So I was, they were live tweeting it from NJ.com last night, the, the Board of Ed meeting. And I was looking at the comments. And one of the comments was this guy who, who came out with a, you know, a charge that the superintendent, who was so anti-bully, had when he went to high school, pushed him against a wall, and this whole thing, like this whole like really inflammatory thing. And then the reporter covering the thing said, please email me and everything. And then somebody else from below it said, um, if, if this guy's as unstable as he was at, you know, what, back in high school days, you know, you can ignore it or something like that. <laughs> the question is, are we only talking about, um, you know, politicians, or are we talking about, in, in that case, it's a very live public sure. event with several sides of story, a lot of unknowns in terms of like, was there sexual abuse? There's not a there's not a charge yet, that kind of thing. So, would you consider that something? That you, would you 
use fact checking, or do or are we only talking about politics? Well, we're, at API, we're trying. I mean, we're focused on politics right now because that's that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. But I think you can see any of these things that we're talking about can be used in any beat that you cover, and and they're just best practices generally. And we do hope that people who don't cover politics will take away. But on another note. I mean, that is such a snake pit to get into social media live debate like right. that. And I think um, every once in a while I do see reporters retweeting things. If you mm. RT something that's that you have not checked, it's it's I don't care what your bio says. You know, <laughs> these are not my own views. It doesn't matter. You should not RT anything that you haven't fact checked. It's a, it's a really bad practice. But um, certain there's probably a lot of garbage on social media sure. about that, but um, but certainly again another reason to check social media for, for fact checking. But but yes, definitely we hope that you can use some of these um, fact checking ideas for any of these. Um, we're not going to do this pop quiz, but when you get the slides, um, if you this is a really bad fact check. <laughs> I'm kind of hesitant to show it because you might know the person who made it. I don't I don't know. Um, but they're Canadian, so maybe not. Um, but in the first 30 seconds, there are two major correlations. I'll just tell you that. You don't have to watch the whole thing. Okay, so we talked about that. One thing, campaign songs. We didn't say campaign. Do you guys have any campaign songs out here that you've heard of? <laughs> um, the Washington Post actually has checked two campaign songs. I'll just play a little bit of this one, if it will all load. Um, okay, this is yeah, this is the fact check. You should read this, and but let's let's see the song if it'll play. This is the campaign song. If you listen to that, there were several statements in there that, that are worth fact checking. And um, they actually, the Post has actually done two um, fact checks on campaign songs. So you might have to go to the candidate's website to, to see that. But, um, Does he tax the rain? Tax, does anybody know what that means, tax in the rain? It's, bas it's basically a pollution tax. And the story was a really good, I mean, this is a really good way to get into the issue and to explain the issue to reader. By, but you're catching people with this song, and um, you know probably people saw the taxing the rain, but it's a it's a runoff tax basically. Um, so you know it's it's a good thing. It's a good um, education for the readers too. All right, so we are not moving here. Arrow keys. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So um, now we're getting down to, to where we're uh, choosing facts. So we have some guidelines on facts to choose. Again, knowing that you guys in this room do not have a full-time fact-checking staff, you don't have time to waste, you don't want to choose a fact, go down a rabbit hole for two days and then say, this is not worth writing. So there are three guidelines that we are, um, that we are promoting for you to use when you're looking for a fact to check. Um, what we don't want you to do is just go out there and say, oh, this looks interesting, I think I'll check it. So that's where you get into trouble, because that is not defensible. Because the first thing that your haters are going to ask you is, why did you choose that fact to check? Why didn't you choose this one? Why didn't you choose my opponent? So you have to think ahead and have a really good reason for 
why you chose that fact. And if you're looking at your statements that you brought in now, um, think about why you chose that fact. And it could be just because it was handy, but that's, that's really not good enough. So we're, we're asking you to find facts that are provable. Um, that's going to be your best bet. It's going to be the best use of your time. If it's a statement that somebody made, a prediction for the future, or an opinion, you're not going to be able to prove that. So you want to have some real data behind your fact checks. And um, if something has numbers in it, or statements that were made in history, or something like something that you can prove, it's going to be a better fact check. It's going to be better for your readers. It's going to be a better use of your time. Singular, by that we mean don't look at a TV ad and try to fact check every single statement that was made in there. Because if you listen to it, there's probably could be 10 or 20 statements in, the, in one ad. Um, don't try to tackle that whole thing um, in one fact check. Do one at a time. Do the most important one. Do the one that's been repeated the most often. But don't do every single one because I have seen those fact checks through this long. Nobody finishes those. So you're not, you're not doing a, a good service to your readers. And finally, you need a defensible method and a criteria. In other words, not random. So again, think ahead to your critics who might ask you why you chose that fact to check. You have to say, well, this is our process. These are the criteria that we use, and this is what we use for everyone. We're not picking on you. Um, so we came up with a list of some quantifiable, some sort of irrefutable criteria that you can use to choose a fact. So find out what was the biggest ad buy. What did they spend the most money on? It's probably going to be a TV ad. You can track social media shares. How, is, is this really getting a lot of traction on Facebook or Twitter? If it's something that's really out there, you're going to want to try to, to track it, to fact check it. And you can say, it was all over the place. That's why we're fact checking it. Um, you can look at the comments on your own stories on your own websites, and if you know you know if something has 500 comments on it, um, well, depending on the size of your news organization, or a thousand or ten thousand, um, that something is blowing up, and you can say this is what people are reading, this is what people are commenting on. Appearances on talk shows, even if it's a local talk show, if there is a candidate or a government official who's going on every local talk show in your city. Um, or the Sunday talk shows and talking about the same thing and making lots of appearances, that's fair game. Um, what we mean by candidate viability, how many of you in this room uh, will write about the very, very, very minor third party candidates in a race or do you sort of ignore them? You sort of ignore them? <laughs> um, you know, it's with the smaller staff, you've got to cut it off somewhere sometimes. And if there is a candidate who has absolutely no ranking in the poll, um, you, you might want to ignore that. On the other hand, if somebody has a huge lead in the polls, you can make a case for fact checking that person and maybe doing it more often. Bless you. Um, reader metrics how many of you have access to all of the metrics on your stories? Not just page views, but um, how how deep people are going into what you know when they bail out where they're coming from where they're going after they read your story all the deep metrics how many of you have access to that that's really good how many of you have access just to page views so again this is a conversation with your editor but I believe that it can only help a reporter to know who's reading your stuff why they're reading it how far they're getting into your story, if they're bailing after 30 seconds, where they're coming from, um, if they're leaving the site entirely after reading your story, that's probably not a good thing. If they're going to another one of your stories after reading your story, that's a very good thing. Um, that can only help you. That kind of information is useful to you to know how to conduct the rest of your job. That's probably another discussion, but um, if you do have a lot of page views on a certain candidate, not another one, that is quantifiable. And repetition of main things. Is it a theme like abortion or whatever that's going that seems to be driving the conversation? Um, that would be a good candidate for fact checking. Um, and then, which is kind of cut off, equal opportunity for all parties. Let me ask you this. Do you think when you're going into, say, covering a campaign, 
um, early in the spring maybe. Do you think it would be fair to set out to say, I am going to do five fact checks of the Republican and I'm going to do five fact checks of the Democrat and make sure that you hit those marks by election day? How many of you think that's a good process or a fair process? There's no right or wrong answer here, mm -hmm. by the way. Does anybody think that, that that would be a good goal to hit? I see some nodding of heads. So um, there, there's debate about this. Um, I, Sarah, I don't know if you want to jump into this or not put you on the spot. Um, sure. I mean, we've talked about it. Um, and, you know, there is a debate. So the debate is, you know, do people, if it's, do you keep a scorecard or not? And I mean, Angie would probably speak better to this than I can. But I, I just think that um, to try to be equal in terms of addressing, you know, Republicans and uh, Democrats equally might not reflect the, the reality of the political discourse that you're, that you're reporting on. So, you know, if you have a Republican who is making outrageous claims every day or vice versa, Democrat making outrageous claims every day, the other party's not, you know, and you try to balance it, you know, we're going to do three facts, that's many, like maybe that's not accurately right. But on the other hand, right, you'll have readers who will come at you and say, oh, you are so biased, I'm never going to read your out again, I'm never going to you're reporting again, and then that you have to deal with that. You know, so I, I don't know. I think that that's I think that there it can be argued either way. Do you want to? You know, I think some of this depends on what the culture and temperament of your newsroom is. Um, in Florida, we, Florida is a state where the elective offices are held overwhelmingly by Republicans. So we're just going to check more Republicans. We only have one statewide Democrat in Florida, Bill Nelson. Hmm. And, um, you know, we fact check people who hold power. So if the power isn't distributed equally, then we might, uh, you might see that in the uh, people we choose to fact check. Um, I will say you need to fact check a spectrum of views um, I don't think you're going to have credibility if you only do fact checks on one side or the other. Um, but we also do not balance the ratings because if you're a fact checker, you need to lay out the facts and let the conclusions come where they may. So, like sometimes we get criticisms of, oh, you said one, you gave one side worse ratings. Well, the ratings are set based on how accurate the statements are. So, you know, we can't we can't control that. Um, the other thing. Uh, so be careful about trying to balance everything perfectly. Um, the other thing on story length, if you're writing for print, I think that's a good idea to have a standard length. Um, online, some of our fact checks have very different lengths because sometimes it's something like you check it, they got it wrong, the press secretary said, oh, he misspoke, done. Uh, other times, here's very super complicated policy issue that has a lot of background that you have to explain it all. That's going to be a longer check. Um, so, uh, I think people are going to be quick to charge bias. Um, just If you're going to do things, if you're going to treat different topics differently, just make sure you're clear in your own mind, like, why are we doing this and not that. So, with story lengths and with scorecards and everything, I hope you're getting the idea that these are all discussions that need to be had before you start doing your fact-checking program, if you're going to do an official program. Yeah. I have a question regarding what you stated and I guess what? She stated regarding uh, the equal. So if you have five and five, and one side happened to be five and they were true, and this happened to be five and they were false. Yeah, you're still in trouble. You're, you're not looking for five <laughs> false on each side. Right. You're just looking for five, five. issues yeah. or statements, and whatever it happens to be is what happens to be, which I think is is good. I don't think looking for, trying to look for the, you know, the one where they lie, both of them to say. Right. Fair. So, yeah. is that what you're talking about? Like, just getting the five statements, just getting regardless five, of the outcome. Five. Yeah, regardless okay. of the outcome. Okay. But it, as you can see, it could end up that way. So you're still screwed, right? But so, at least you did the five. So you <laughs> said, <laughs> yeah, you still did. <laughs> and that's why, going back to the slide about the quantifiable, quantifiable criteria for choosing a fact, if you can point to, um, you know, why you chose, you know, it's the biggest ad buy, and so we chose these five. You know, it was getting the most traction on social media. We chose those five. Um, and that just to have that on the tip of your head, you know, on the tip of your head, because um, right, if you end up having five false and five true, and it happens that way, then you know you point to this is what was happening. Yeah. The, the other the other thing is, I mean, this is where internal conversations are really good, where you can say like, hey, we did this fact check. How is this going to look to somebody who supports this person or someone who opposes this person? What you know, what should our next check be? 
how do we make sure that um, we're bringing the same level of aggressiveness to the entire campaign? I mean, I think the findings can can shake out the way they want, but I do think um, I do think you want to you want to have a good process and you want to really be like skeptical of all sides um, and. And that's where, like, you do want to have these internal conversations, especially with someone who maybe thinks about it a little differently than you do or has a different approach to it than you do. And um, in the end, it's probably not your decision anyway. My boss and I disagree on this, and we have agreed to disagree. So, But it has to be a conversation. And it's just process, process, process. You have to have that pinned down before you start doing this. So getting into quickly, um, again, looking at the um, – the statements that you um, brought in to check. We, there are categories of deception. If you studied advertising in college, you probably studied a little bit of this. So we put together three separate categories of deception that you probably haven't really thought about, but you're gonna find some one of these, at least one of these in all of the statements that you brought. So um, I want you to look at what you brought and see what you, what you see. Um, as far as these three categories. And again, these are all in your slides. Um, the first one we're calling deception by addition of, and subtraction. So deceptive dramatization, that's when you have um, sort of like dueling statements and photos. The photo does not match the statement or the statement does not match the photo, whichever one. And if you think about it, a lot of ads look like that out of context words and phrases. That's pretty self-explanatory, and I, I think that you've probably seen a few of those. Um, misuse of words and phrases from legitimate sources. This is very similar to some of the, um, the movie trailers or the ads for movies that you see that, that just take words out of a review, like, uh -huh. you know, fantastic. <laughs> and I'll just put it in quotes, and what the review actually said was, this is a fantastic waste of time. You know? <laughs> and that happens all the time. And they're doing it to your stories, your editorials. Um, so that's also something to look at. Deception by omission. What are they not saying? And cherry picking stats. Um, what I what I have linked this to is just a really excellent fact check. It's one of the best fact checks that I've ever seen. The factcheck.org did this. If you have time, we may look at it if we have time later, but if not, please look at that one. They've done a, it's a video fact check. It's very fancy. Most of you guys aren't going to be able to do it, but it can, it, as you watch it, you can see that it can easily be done in print too. So be sure to look at that one. Um, so two is deception by association. So visual selections. Um, you will probably never see an attack ad, one, one candidate against another, where the candidate has chosen a nice photo of his opponent, right? They're mm -hmm. always like in grayscale, or they're really <laughs> fuzzy, or they, they're caught eating something, or <laughs> whatever. So that happens all the time. Irrelevant narrative. I saw part of an ad this morning. You guys probably know what this is. Uh, and I, I missed the whole thing except for this one part where the guy kept saying, um, um, I like the soup or the soup is, does anybody know what I'm talking about? It was just a clip from, he was on a talk show or something and he said, the soup is great. And then they would talk about policy and things like that. And then they'd go to him making the scoopy statement on a talk show. Mm -hmm. Nobody's seen that. It was on NBC this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so had nothing to do with the policy statements that were being made. Just They just wanted to pull out this goofy clip. Um, guilt by disassociation and guilt by association. Um, I think those are probably clear what those mean. Um, guilt or guilt. GILT by association where you're, you're putting yourself next to somebody who uh, you want to be associated with um, or they put you next to somebody who you should not be associated with. Um, disassociation is, that's like a whole nother um, subject, but has anybody heard of the book or the upcoming movie called Merchants of Doubt? Um, when that comes out, see it. Um, the book is good. The I saw a clip of the um, of the video, which has won all kinds of awards at film festivals, mm -hmm. and it talks about how, mostly how the tobacco industry um, managed their message, and 
really put forth false facts to the public to get their minds off of how tobacco can kill you. And one thing, I'll just say this really quickly, um, they tried to put people's attention on the fact that pajamas were flammable. Does everybody remember the whole uh, flammable pajamas thing? Mm -hmm. That was, and this, this book and the movie explains it, behind that whole campaign was the tobacco industry. They were trying to get you to not think about the fact that tobacco causes lung cancer, but that these horrible pajama manufacturers <laughs> were, were making flammable pajamas. And so that's what we mean by guilt by disassociation. Um, but anyway, that's just a little aside. You should see that movie if, if you can. It's, it's good for all journalists. Um, and it was um, co-written by a Chicago Tribune reporter. Okay, and the final category is deception by words. Again, words are really, really important. Insinuation, innuendo, we see that all the time. Glittering generalities, um, this is, this is where, where you have to start paying attention if you keep hearing the candidates say, we and us, and those are key words to pay attention to because if they're talking, if they're trying to group themselves with other people, then there's probably something suspicious there. Uh, hypocrisy and double standards, again, that's a big one, and conspiracy theories. Um, what was the big conspiracy theory of the last two presidential elections? Obama's birthplace, yeah. So, um, I have another one here, and I'm hoping that, I think this was a Facebook, yeah. So this is something that, uh, that Pundit, PolitiFact actually did this. Uh, this is a, a Facebook conspiracy theory. Again, we didn't mention that, but Facebook is a good place to find statements to check too. So you might want to look at, at that one too. All right, let's get back to where we were. Um, so we, we wanted to tell you about these categories of deception so that you can tell your readers about it. Um, you don't have to use these exact words, but when you're writing your fact check, you should tell them what the deception is. You should explain in some way what the deception is. It's probably something that you're not doing specifically now, but um, we really recommend that so that people understand, so they can look for it too and sort of define it. Um, again, this I got messed up. We're not going to play this now, but this is another test for you. These are uh, a lot of forms of deception in this um, fact check that you can do for homework. And finally, I think that we just have time to do this before lunch, um, seven steps of a fact check. So this is where you really get down to work. Um, this is American Press Institute's recommendations for uh, fact checking and the steps that you should take for every single fact check that you do. Uh, people will differ um, and you might have some steps to put in there of your own but this is what we're recommending as a good starting point. Um, the first thing that we recommend and I think PolitiFact does this too and maybe um, factcheck.org, the first minute you know that you are going to be checking the statement, the first thing you do is called the person who you're checking. So why would we do that? Why would we recommend that as, as the very first step? Well, you would want to make sure that that person actually said the thing that you're checking. Sure. Yeah, but <coughs> say say you already knew that because you saw him say it. I have a chance to correct it or say it. Courtesy? Yeah, it's sort of courtesy and also giving them uh, ample opportunity to respond because, again, this goes back to the defensible process. You want to be able to say, we called him or her right away and we gave them all the time that we had to uh, formulate a response. So that's the first thing you do, but you will be calling it back later in the process. But I would also say like it's a good part of the reporting process because sometimes they point us to evidence that we hadn't thought of or seen or considered. I mean, or sometimes they'll point us to something that we know is wrong and they'll just it helps it, it helps you do it faster I know there's a temptation to wait until you know what you're talking about to contact <laughs> them but like what I do is I send off an email and I say like hey we're fact checking this we just decided and we're doing our own research but I wanted to let you know as soon as possible we were looking at it and then that kind of lets you off the hook that you don't have to know everything but it speeds up the process so that they can send you research back 
as soon Sometimes as they you can get sink it. sink themselves even deeper, <laughs> which makes it even more interesting. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the step two is just your basic reporting. You start reporting. You start gathering the evidence. And as you're gathering the evidence using the tools and the, the uh, research sites that we showed you, then you are going to naturally probably come up with a list of experts you can talk to. Um, and then you actually contact the experts, making sure that you have people who are on, um, if it's that kind of issue, on all kinds, uh, all sides of the issue, pro, con, neutral. Um, again, the same thing you would do for any story, I, I would think. Um, then you take all this research and all this knowledge that you have, and you formulate your questions, and you interview the either the subject or the statement maker, um, whichever it seems appropriate for, um, for this particular fact check. So you have as much evidence as you can possibly get. And of course, in that interview, you ask them, where did you get your facts? Where did you get your facts to back up what you just said in this, this ad or whatever it is that you're fact checking? So you will have that information. Um, and step five is what I talked about before, fact checking your fact check. It has to be part of the process. You go back, you use the tools if you need, if those are useful to you. Um, you check the statements that the person made in your interview, and you go back to original sources. So you are double checking your work. Um, step six: If you have a rating or a conclusion, hopefully you will have a conclusion or a rating. Um, that's when you decide that you don't want to say that. You never want anybody to think that you have concluded something before you do all those other steps. So again, transparency. If anybody asks you what your process is, you say, this is our process. We're not selecting the rating until we get down here. Um, you can be very transparent about this process. And then editing and review. So it goes through, what we recommend is it goes through your regular editing process, but then there's one extra step that you probably don't normally do and that is to send it to a third party editor who has not been involved in the original fact check. So that editor is someone who has, is coming to the story as a reader, hopefully. It could, be, it could be the science editor, or the features editor, or the sports editor, but somebody who's a good editor and a reader who can sit there and read your fact check and point out things that maybe you didn't think of and uh, say, as a reader, um, you didn't really go into this, or I don't understand this part, and then you can go back and fix those things if, if that's what you need to do. Um, and Angie can tell you about their final, final editing process. Yeah, in our final process, we bring the back, the assigning editor brings the back check to two other editors who read it, and the three editors together vote on, mm -hmm. um, vote to approve or change the final rating. The reporter suggests a rating, but the three editors vote to, to determine it. Um, and this is just like a really important quality control for us. I mean, you know, we catch line edits, we catch typos, you know, little ga gaps in logic or where we're assuming too much knowledge on the part of the reader, or sometimes where the fact check is just going on and on and it loses its, you know, people are like, where are you going with this? Um, all those things get 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 fixed and improved when we bring it to the two editors, the other two editors who haven't seen it before. Um, you know, and it's also just like a good kind of common sense check. You know, of like, well, yeah, but what about this? You know, um, some of the fact checks. Sometimes when the fact checks kind of go wrong, it's because like somebody didn't stop and take a step back and look at it the way a regular reader would look at it. So this is where it's good to be politifact because I would, how many of you could uh, find three editors on deadline to, <laughs> <laughs> to read your story? Um, and that, you know, we don't have that luxury, but it's, it's good to build that into the process. And the final thing that I don't have up there is that we do recommend as soon as you are finished with that fact check, as soon as it's gone through the editing process, that you publish it immediately online. So immediately. And why, why would we recommend that? Because something can change, right? No? Well, it's not going to change, hopefully, but what would be the transparency reason? Oh, that you're holding it for, for political advantage. For a reason. Yeah. So you need to be able to say, 
we finished this, we did it, we did all our due diligence, and then we published it immediately. We did not hold it so that so-and-so could have time to um, do another ad or anything like that. You want to be able to say you published it immediately. You can't do that in print, but you can certainly do it online. Um, again, part of the process. So. What about in the days leading up to an election? Do you ever hesitate to do something like that, like the day before an election or the weekend of an election? Because that's when I find that that's when the candidates are spouting the most ridiculous things that need to be fact-checked because they don't think they're going to do it. You know, we fact-check right up to election day. Um, I think this idea that... Um, I think, I think the idea that newspapers shouldn't publish political stories right before an election is an idea from a previous era. You know, when people couldn't go online and find any information they wanted. Um, so we, we fact check right up until the end. Now what we find in practice is we don't often get a lot of new messaging at the very end. I mean, the, the campaigns, just and I say this from having observed them for so long, it's like they're getting their primary messages out like a few months, six weeks before the election. When they get to the final stretch, they're just repeating themselves over and over. They're desperately trying to get voters' attention. So I don't see them like making new, provocative, substantial statements at the last minute. If, but whenever they do, we fact check it. Yeah, I mean, it could happen. I just think it's an old-fashioned idea of like not doing coverage because you might influence the election. I mean. You know, maybe when there was no internet and you know, and the newspaper was the only game in town that made sense. It certainly doesn't make sense. Today. How many of you do blackouts on campaign coverage, like on the Monday before the Tuesday? Okay, that so that's good because that is a really old-fashioned idea. And I I know even at, when I was at the Post, and you Don might remember this, we would have blackouts on campaign coverage. We would go with the candidates on the trail, but we would not do any substantial things. So I'm going to talk kind of loud and fast here. Um, um, I wonder if we are not finished. Sure, might finished. be, a, might, well, but we have Angie's team and her data team here ready yeah. to do that part. Do we do that at lunch? Um, do you, how well? Are people staying in the room? Yeah, they are staying in the room. But we're also going to have a bathroom break and everything. Yeah. I mean, we're we're um, we. we can you let them do that? Oh, you, you're almost done this. As yeah, soon as they're done this, yeah. let's do it and then and then have lunch. Yeah. Lunch is not going to get cold. It's sandwiches. So okay. So all right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we just have a couple of calls. You're not finished yet. This is um, kind of the important part of this. So after you finish your fact check, we talked about this a little. You have to market it. Um, I can make a whole speech on this in general for reporters. You have to be the owners and the marketers, the promoters of your own work, because nobody else is going to do it for you, and there's so much noise out there, you have to do it. So anybody who says, I don't do social media, um, you're in the wrong era. You have to do it yourself, and you have to have a plan. And your marketing, marketing plan should be part of planning of any story. And why do I say this? How many of you saw the story last week about Trust in Media. This is a Gallup poll that they do every two years. Trust in Media is at an all-time low. And if people knew about the good work you were doing and the fact-checking and the processes that you have, I don't think that we would have this kind of rating. Any other company that saw their, their ratings drop like this, what would they do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know they would call a consultant and we're just not going to do that we have to do that ourselves so these are just some tips on how to market and promote your fact check again should be part of your conversation and process from the beginning not an afterthought oh I need to put that in Facebook um, and I think so you're already doing this news partnerships and getting other ways to promote you work with the League of Women Voters, somebody who's nonpartisan, nonprofit, and um, offer your fact checks to them. Um, at API, we are happy to publish anybody's fact checks in our roundups, in our weekly roundups, which we'll be doing for a while. Um, if you would click on these when you get the slides, these are aggregators that if you will send me your fact checks, I will put these in the, I will make sure that you have your feeds in these um, in these fact checks, PolitiFact, if you go to their website, on the right-hand side of their website, they have someone every morning who goes through 
the clips or the online clips and and um, ads um, good fact checks so it gets a lot more exposure for you um, reddit has a fact checking um, section too um, trove is a washington post product that um, i started a, a what they call a trove and it's for fact checking and anybody in here who wants to send me their fact checks or put their fact checks in there um, just sign up and and do it and let us know as well if you have any new jersey fact checks and you know particularly if you've heard anything. <laughs> And finally, you don't want to do your fact check and walk away. How many of you read the comments on your stories? I know it's hard, but <laughs> you got to do it because you might get some good information. You need to respond, and if you have a correction, again, transparency, you need to correct it in a transparent way right at the top of the fact check. Um, all the fact checkers do this, and if you put it on Facebook and it was wrong on Facebook, you need to put it on Facebook again or Twitter. So again, that needs to be part of the process. So um, that's it. I think we can go to.